Oh, look, there we go. Let's go right. Perfect timing. Um, yeah, so for those who might be watching, not sure what's going on, uh, we're basically planning um, to try and find a way that we can uh, generate GitLab change logs, uh, but also change log for all our associated projects, uh, ideally within GitLab itself, preferably as automated as we can. Um, there's a couple of different ways. The two sort of proposals or ideas we currently have is one, we have this sort of semi automatic setup where we use our releases page, but we populate that with data generated by release tools. So it's automated in the sense that uh, it doesn't require user interaction, but it isn't fully baked into GitLab because uh, it you know, released also their own tooling. The other approach is that we do try and fully bake this into GitLab, where, for example, you create a tag, then mark it as a release, and somehow GitLab will know what commits to include what issues, you know, whatever the data is that we um, decide to use. Uh, both approaches have their pros and cons. Um, they have some restrictions. Uh, the two sort of leading or starting questions that we currently have is one, if we can get rid of the changelog files, and two, if we can populate changelog data with uh, commit titles. And there's two issues for that. Um, where we basically asked that question, can we do that to get some feedback? Um, so if the, the backstory there is we have these public projects, we have our security mirrors, and we run security releases from these security mirrors, which means that during a security release, if we create a release in GitLab, according to a tag, uh, it won't know what the merge requests are that went into that release. It wouldn't know what project to get that data from. Uh, the only data it has is whatever is within the uh, public project at that time, uh, which happens to be commits. Uh, even issues for security work, I believe, are kept confidential until I believe two days after the release. Um, so if we use that, for example, the, the change log will basically be empty until those issues are visible. Um, with that all set, the, the proposal that I wrote up so far it is this setup where release tools generates the data uh, for us. It's just one of probably many ways of doing it. And um, I really like people to sort of poke holes in that proposal and uh, basically tear it apart as much as possible because I am kind of noticing I myself am sort of developing a bit of tunnel vision where I think, hey, this is the approach show. That's sort of what we go for. Um, but they know that there's probably better approaches. Uh, there are sort of three requirements that we have. You know, one, when we do a security release, the security changes need to be in the change log somehow. Uh, this, you know, it might not be able to link to issues, or perhaps it can, but you can't view them just yet. But at least some sort of title should be there saying what went into that release. Uh, the second is that whatever we include should actually be released. Um, there's some issues, for example, where the release management team proposes to include merged merge requests into a release. Uh, GitLab has the additional requirement that uh, when a merge request is merged, it also first has to be deployed before we consider it released. Uh, and then the third is that changes specific to Enterprise Edition ideally are either separated, so in a separate section as part of the change log, or somehow indicated as being EE specific. Uh, right now we have them in separate change log files, but if you, for example, use the releases page, this might just be a section within the release or you know, some sort of caller, any kind of indicator that says this is EE specific. Uh, I think outside of that, outside of those three requirements, um, as far as I understand, we basically have full freedom to figure out how we're gonna do this. Um, so that's sort of my first agenda point. If anybody would like to poke holes in my proposal, tear it apart, you know, tell me that it's a horrible idea, please do so. Um, or just has feedback in general on it.
so I, I want to start with a um, kind of disclaimer. So for a very long time, I was uh, very, very sure that change logs should not be commit lists, should not be merge request titles, should just be something designed for a human to read it and understand it, which is more yeah, structured than just regular list of commits of titles. I do understand that if we wanted to do something that is automated, this is the direction we have to go and I'm actually fine with it. I have to admit that I don't believe in list of commits because looking at how some of our summer requests are merged, number of commits, titles of commits, and just how say our the commits lists are um, poorly designed. I think that we we are risking to release things with um, terrible change log or either empty or completely unusable. So I would try to stick with merge request title, obviously. And in regards of security releases as a challenge, what I'm thinking is this, that you are right that merge requests are kept, conf yeah, they're not com confidential, they are in the private project. So the problem is this, that if you link to the merge request, merge request on private project will never be accessible just in terms of links. But I'm thinking that first thing we should consider listing titles. Because if we get the title and we write down the title of the merge request, it still remains there. And it's we are going to release um, a blog post the same day as the security release. So there will be more content and more details in the blog post than actually what will end up in the uh, change log. So it's just an easy way for linking the two things. I don't know how to solve the um, linking to the merge request problem, but I I think we never solved that. If I'm no, I'm I'm if I'm correct, I, I'm sure. When we do the change the file, so right now when we do change log on files during a security release, you should not put the merge request number. So either today our uh, change log for security release only has titles. Uh, yeah, I believe that is the case. Let me very quickly. Uh, yeah, yeah, that's the case. I I'm sure. Yeah. I'm, 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 so I think that is something we could continue living with if we want because we if we are writing tooling around this because we already have tools that can navigate the system so it can link back to the original issue we may consider in that case to perform the link navigation and just provide you a link to the issue which will be public in 30 day more or less so it's still well it's still something right on the so yeah. sorry go ahead no i was just thinking that oh. Uh, in <clears throat> in terms of how so release tools or within GitLab, I, I I I truly believe that if we do this in release tools is I mean just just another thing that we built on top of that very similar to what uh, LabKit is doing. I'm I'm not sure if it's still in place, but three years ago the runners has exactly the same implementation. So they were just gathering, there was a script that was gathering uh, merge with titles. So it seems like we are just rewriting the same script over and over and over. And in one case, it writes on change log and the other one writes in the in a file. But I think that we should consider whatever we generate something, keep adding it in the history so that it is also available for someone that has no access to GitLab itself, but it just cloned. Even if it has to be a challenge in terms of, I don't know how to put things in sequence, which I think is a problem we already solved in, in our changelog compilation, but eventually we may consider having a changelog folder when there is just one file for each release. Because I know projects, some projects are doing something like, like that. So, I mean, it's, it's just something or even just one every minor. So you get one major minor and then you only uh, write on top of it or on the bottom. 
that's my right. point. Yeah. So the the question I have there, let's say that we use um, which quest titles, for example. If we drive this through release tools, so in other words, the change log is generated by release tools and it just attaches it as the release notes, uh, then we can do that. And that, that's sort of the proposal that I have currently um, where we populate the data. Um, but this is something you know, a lot of projects do. And so it would be nice if within GitLab, you could basically just you know, trigger release and maybe click a checkbox that says you know, generate release data. And it does that all for you. But that's uh, for security mirrors that creates a problem where if you generate a release in the public project, how would it know what project to pull those security merge request titles from or issues, you know, whatever it is. But we don't generate on, when we are doing a security release, we generate on the security mirror. Right, so, so, so right now we do, but the issue there is because those mirrors are private, we at some point have to somehow duplicate that data in the uh, public project. So what I would envision is we, um, let's say we have this built in GitLab. Uh, what you do from release tools here, you do the whole security release flow, et cetera. When the tag gets mirrored, somehow it will create a release for that in the public project you know, with all the data needed. Uh, but at that point, it needs to know how are we going to get those merge request titles from the security mirror? Uh, because GitLab itself doesn't have sort of any understanding that we actually want that here. Um, so I felt, okay, you could maybe mark a project as related so that when you generate a release, it pulls you know, data from that project. But then you go down this sort of security rabbit hole uh, with questions like, okay, what happens if I am funny and I add some random person's private project? Now suddenly the yeah. merge requests get exposed in my changelog data, for example. I don't think this is um, a, a real problem we need to solve in a generic way. So just think for a moment that GitLab can do this on his own when a tag is created. If it's configured in project somewhere, it can do it. Now think about this. We are, and so uh, when we tag, something gets created in the release page. This is already the case. It's just the release note that is missing. So this feature may generate the release note autonomously. Now, if we have that feature in place, well, it means that regular releases will just get tagged on the public mirror and the public, yeah, public repo and everything will be fine. Then we tag private one on, on security one on the private one. And as well there, there will be the correct thing because the, the same thing can run on the other project without knowing about mirroring and things like that. I think that here is where in the publish phase, we could do something at release tools. So outside of the product, when we say gather release note, copy release note. Right. Now, that's one option. Uh, so if, for example, there's sort of a, I guess, extension of that where um, uh, the tag description will contain the full release notes and then mirroring will pick that up. Uh, that is indeed one option. It's a fairly nice option. Uh, I think uh, this is sort of a discussion I had with Amy as well. The sort of original goal is to dog food our product as much as possible, basically build this in GitLab. In other words, you press button, done. I'm of the opinion that, I, you know, at least I'm conflicted. I think it might be a step too much because we get these things where uh, you know, how, how on earth are you going to create a release on a public project, pulling in data from a private project and somehow sort of establish that link within GitLab. Um, taking into account that we are probably one, you know, there's probably 10 projects or organizations that use GitLab that would need that. Everybody else probably has a public project and, you know, they're fine with just that. Um, that's kind of how I ended up with my current proposal, like, hey, let's basically use release tools to populate this markdown release notes section. And that might be entirely a valid approach. Um, so I'm kind of uh, mostly hoping that there's an approach where you don't have to do that, where you basically generate a release and GitLab somehow knows what the previous release is, either because you give it or you know, because we assume semantic versioning. 
and then it displays this list dynamically, basically of all the merge requests, issues, epics, you know, whatever. Um, but that doesn't work across these projects. Cause... So what if you create a mechanism where it's generic enough for that project, but you have some sort of hook where you could amend the release notes after they've been created? So say we're doing a security release. We perform the release. It populates the release page with an empty list because all those commits, all those merge requests are somewhere else. But we could tag or we could modify release tools to say, hey, we've done this release process. This was a security release. Go to the security projects. Get me those commits or merge requests. Let's amend the release page at this moment in time. I was actually was looking at our API. Very, we can uh, do this. Sorry. I, I was thinking something very similar to that, where we introduce a new concept called a draft release. And a draft release would be tied to a branch, whether it be master or for us, like maybe the stable branches for backports. And then that draft release would just keep a tally of all the merge requests that are going in since the last release. And then there'd be a step just to promote the draft release to a release after you make edits to kind of clean it up a bit. Um, that would be useful for us. It ignores the whole security mirror thing, but, um, and I think it'd be useful for, I could see personal projects also like that I've had, like, or this would be useful where my draft release for master would just kind of keep track of merge requests. And then when I'm ready to tag, then I have all those merge requests in one place. I promote the draft to the release, make some edits, and then I'm good to go. I think one thing we should also keep in mind, we keep talking about the security release process specifically, but we don't ever talk about bringing in changes from Omnibus or Giddily into our release notes as well. Is that under the same scope or is that just, we haven't. I, I was that thinking way. that we sort of keep it similar to what we have now where for every project, we populate that project's releases page with their data. And, you know, we can okay. do something manually where for GitLab, we just add, you know, in the release notes, a link to these different projects. Um, but I, I don't see us moving to like a sort of mono, bleh, monolithic change lock where one project has the data of all the others, but they don't have the data of themselves. Uh, like in terms of draft leads and such, yeah, it all sounds like a, a great idea. Uh, I think it all comes down to like, we remain in control of how we populate this data as in you know, we fetch it, we essentially push it into the release uh, instead of, you know, click and then GitLab fetches it. Um, I was looking at the API and actually we already support um, updating a release. So release notes can be updated through the API. So I, I was still in the release team when this feature was developed, the first iteration and up also back then there was a discussion about having draft releases because uh, Git, GitHub supports it. I think it got never implemented and never get any traction. So yeah, but I, I mean, we can alter the content of right. the release page already today. Yeah, I think if we have release tools, populate the data, draft release is maybe a little less useful because at that point we fully control the format and you know, it's fully automated. It's basically the same process as we have now. We just change what the, the input is from YAML files to merge request tiles or whatever it is. Um, I think based on the feedback, <laughs> it, it's reassuring to hear that my idea wasn't as you know crazy as I thought, um, but it's also a little sort of coming from the dog fooding perspective, uh, it's, it's a little frustrating, but not surprising that this appears to be the approach so far because it covers basically everything we need. Um, Cause I'm basically thinking, well, let's say you have you know, your own project and you want to do this. You could use the releases page, but you'd still have to write your own tool into fetch merge requests, whatever, you know, make some API calls and we can do, yeah, we can extend what, what do we call it? Uh, the GitLab releaser. The, the go tool. Yeah, the release CLI, something like that. Yeah, something like that. Uh, we could extend that to uh, make use of this. I 
think it would make it a little easier. Um, I'm just thinking like, I wonder what the adoption rates of that will be compared to you know, click, click button to generate leads and know everything happens for you. I think that last thing is of course more attractive, but at least for ourselves would be quite a challenge to, to build. Um, but that's kind of what I mentioned in the past, like this, there's sort of two angles. We can go from the dog footing perspective, which is build everything in GitLab, you know, as much as possible, or we can go sort of from the perspective, like how do we just make this easier? Uh, and I think as far as I understand, everybody, we're now sort of going from that approach where we say, how do we make this easier? Oh, we, you know, we use release tools, we change its input, and then we populate the releases page, but we still control how we do that. Uh, versus let's put everything in GitLab and then figure out how we make that work for us. Um, uh, sorry, go ahead. No, I was going to say on that regard, I'm a bit more inclined in the extending the release GLE approach, which kind of try to get a, the best of the both world. Because if reading your comments, reading the discussion that we are having, we kind of identified two, three, main way of handling change logs. One could be just give me the list of commits. The other one could be just give me the merge request title. So considering this some kind of strategies so that the release click could have one, starting with one, one uh, default strategy, merge request title. Next release, someone else in, in release team can write the commit list strategy, whatever, and, uh, and a, a blank strategy where you say, this is your script in CI, do whatever you want with me, the data in this file, and I will handle it. I think it's, it's kind of the kind of middle ground that can give um, uh, an easy way to start to the projects that just say, I don't care, just yeah, I, I work on Madriga, so give me Madriga's title will be fine. And also can accommodate uh, needs of, yeah, teams that have more complex workflow. Uh, in, in response to add questions to the doc, um, how would we envision using that CLI from release tools? Like we could spawn a process that runs it. Um, I kind of feel like it goes a little against what we did where we moved away from Git repos and sort of local storage and try to do everything directly in the API. We could, of course, re-implement <coughs> it because it's not that much. Um, but I think that sort of poses the question like, okay, if yeah, it, it feels a bit like if we don't use it and we build it, it feels a little like uh, we sort of ne neglect it. So you say, oh yeah, you can do it this way, but we don't use that. We use this other thing. Yeah, I think we need to run it in GitLab CI in the GitLab project because it's designed. I think it's also, it, I actually understand that this is a release task and I think inject some special tokens, which I, th I think is why you can update the release page. Because otherwise- Yeah, it's designed to be used in the CI job. Yeah, so in my opinion, this is something that we have to implement so that we can run it. And GitLab right. CI, Omnibus CI, whatever. So when we tag, it, it runs into the magic. Yeah. Yeah, I think the... Um, yeah, that could work in release tools because in release tools, we, we don't really... Uh, the way I would see that working is we, um, we basically strip out the change log generation process. Uh, we just tag, create branches, whatever. And then I think when that tag is created, the CI job will populate its own release data. If that fails for whatever reason, it, that's a little annoying, but it's also not really a release blocker. Um, I think the tricky thing there, well, it's like, it's very specific to us. We'd have to make sure that when we run uh, that kind of pipeline, we don't run like the full test suite and everything, because that's just straight up redundant. Uh, and that would, would cause these random failures. We, we can spawn more than one pipeline uh, with a single event because we have tag pipelines, we have merge request right. pipelines, so we can just make sure that when you tag, just run this or 
everything we think is needed. Yeah, for example, in the CI config, we say, hey, if this environment variable set, don't run this job. And then we set that you know, for all the unrelated jobs and pass that variable when we uh, the, we set that automatically for tag, something like that. Um, it's preventing us from just doing a comparison between the, like, the current tag we have and then the previous patch tag and just gathering the differences between those two. Because if we're talking about like the, the immediate problem I see with that is it won't really work for monthly releases, but like monthly releases, if you just say, just go see the blog post, that's the best change log there is for monthly releases. And then patch releases is all these minor things that happen between the two tags. Yeah, so if we, I, I don't know how the release CLI determines of the range of commits or whatever it is to, uh, figure out how to populate the release nodes. I would imagine you'd probably have to specify the, the previous tag or commit or something like that. Um, if you just tag, that's a little tricky because the pipeline would run for that tag, but it wouldn't know what the previous one is. So I would imagine you would have to yeah, somehow provide that info. You can um, get it with git describe. Right, so the thing there is, let's say you have, uh, yeah, I think that would actually work because we tag stable branches. So given a stable branch, you can get the, the previous tag sorted. Tricky then is if you create a new stable branch, you would have to figure out, okay, what is the previous, uh, am I saying that correctly? Because No, I think you're right. The problem is that we tag on the stable branch, which means that when you create the, mi the, the, the new minor version, it will, it will not be able to detect the previous one. Because basically from the, you tag, so you, you create a stable branch and then say, I'm, I'm going to tag here something. So find me out, which is the, describe me the previous, how far I am from the previous tag. And it goes to master and keep going down and it cannot infer the tag name from the from the branch because we tag on the branch after populating the, the change log. So if you oh, would have yeah, tagged right. on master, it, it would be able to correctly right. assess the previous one. Although then if we tag on master, if you do a backport, I think the next release would get confused because the last tag would be that backport tag. So uh, no, put... because you tag on 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 the other branch. So in that case, you are already on a, on a branch tag, and and it will find you the the nearest tag between your ancestors. Ancestors. So there should be another dot one, dot two, dot something, even if it's dot zero, because it gets you the closest, the closest tag. Um, so in that setup, w would we always? Wait, so, so what do we tag on master? Or do we always tag on that's zero. That's it. The monthly. Oh, right, right, right. Ah, okay. Because you want to... Yeah, but again, because what will happen is that... Yeah, but then you have duplication as well. Yeah, then, then so if I, you generate... But I think it's, but it's already the case. It's already the case because when we now pick... Uh, so something is a master and will be in the next in the next monthly. So in the next monthly, there will be that change log line because it's right. a master. If you pick something of some of those fix for a patch release, so current monthly, not next one, it will still have the same line because it's part of the right. thing that you pick. So it's already the case and will be yeah, exactly yeah. the same. So that is fine. I'm just thinking, let's say you tag everything on master. Uh, oh, sorry, let's say you take the dot zero on master. You do a bunch of patch releases. I'm kind of wondering what happens if I'm not thinking out loud here. Um, no, yeah, so whatever is merged to master at that point should go in the release. So I think that should be fine. Uh, it just creates this little funny logic where you say, oh, hey, you know. Uh, patch releases are tagged on stable branches, but dot zero releases are only tagged on master, which is a little weird. I think because if 
let's say we prepare a stable. So we branch. change the version file, and this is will break everything because you have to change the version file and master, and then tag, right. and then you have to revert it or set it to the next one. So it's it's a bit clunky. Yeah, that also. And I'm thinking if you, let's say you create a stable branch. You find out, oh, it has something broke, so you put a bunch of fixes only on that stable branch. If you then tag master, that tag won't have those fixes. So it seems like we would have to keep tagging on stable branches, I think. But either way, what you could do for that is just specify the previous tag somehow, or GitLab assumes semantic versioning. And so it gets all the tags, gets the one that you're currently tagging, and then somehow figures out what the previous one is, um, which is to tricky thing in its own right, but I think it's doable. Uh, considering basically every project for their tags will use V X, Y, Z as the format. Um, I think that is something sort of more on the side as in we can decide to start with just having release tools populate this data and then release tools knows what the new version is. It knows how we sort of tag and branch things off. So it can figure out what the range is and then generate the data. And then later we can probably see, okay, how can we sort of reproduce this in the, the CLI so other people can use it? Um, I, I think for now, yeah, we have to focus like, do we, uh, <laughs> do we own this fully automatic? Or are we going to populate it ourselves as in using release tools? Um, let me take, Look at the doc. Um, yeah, Jeff, do you want to cover the part about script that you added to the the doc? I don't think it matters too much here, but a uh, buddy of mine, former coworker, uh, recently wrote his own utility for dealing with change logs. For uh, they have a very similar um, stack, although it's written in Python. It's called edX.org, which is the online learning uh, MOOC. Uh, platform they have like a kind of a similar thing which is they operate out in the open and then they have a self-managed installation anyway this is what he wrote for that um i think and it might be interesting just to kind of go through but you know i don't know like these features it sounds like um his perspective is that he wants things kind of like controlled in source management and if we build this into the product you know you lose out on that sort of thing like you know we'll be attaching meta information to a project so um but I'm, I'm a little bit lost or I'm unclear like what customers really want. Like I, I see that you have what other projects are doing, but um, for customers that think that we should embed change log functionality into the product, what exactly did they have, do they have in mind? Like maybe we don't have any data for that. Right, yeah, I, I talked to her Amy yesterday. I mentioned to her I was a little surprised that this sort of became an OKR because there was sort of this sort of side proposal I made. It was like, oh yeah, if you, if you have some extra time, we could do that. Um, in particular, because I kind of get, I think most of our enterprise users probably wouldn't care too much about change logs because they, but it's, I, I don't know if, uh, you know, probably shouldn't share any names, but you know, the, the big whatever, if they produce change logs, this is usually something more used by uh, GNOME or KDE or you know, the, the free software project. I was working for a big gas um, company and they used to produce changelog and they actually built a lot of tooling around it and was mandatory to create oh, right. changelogs. So I think that was probably from a sort of auditing perspective more. I think it's just for helping uh, on-site uh, support because they oh, were right. dealing with software in gas station. So you may have something deployed some way in the northern of, I, I don't know, very far from anything. And the, the more you can understand from the data that you have at hand, the better it is. Right. Yeah, I think um, one option, and that's also what I discussed, is that we um, we populate this change log. So we have least no data ourselves. So with basically the markdown that we currently have. And then perhaps over time, we can sort of enrich this by also displaying issues, merge requests, and that, that we fetch sort of dynamically. 
Um, the benefit there being is that if that is not entirely accurate, like it doesn't include security merge requests, for example, that's okay because we still have the the actual change log entries that we populated. Um, and that way, you know, for auditing purposes, for example, we have full control over what we want to display and can guarantee that what actually went in the release is in there. Um, and it seems we're basically in agreement that probably that is the best approach. Um, let's see on the doc, make sure I'm not missing people. Um, Let's see, Skyrack amend release. Oh, yeah, that was the draft release. So just a reiteration of what we already discussed. Yeah. Uh, Java draft release will show because extend to it. We ran in a slightly different order. Uh, Robert, do you want to cover your part about backports? Yeah, I just wanted to keep in mind that we need to have this handle backports as well, or potentially the same MR or same issue is included in multiple releases where we can't just like apply a label to a merge request that says, hey, include this in the change log. And then we do a release and it gets removed. And then the next like same backport doesn't have that change in it. This is stuff, you know, we had to figure out the first time around was like, how do we do the change logs for, you know, the file based stuff and having it included in the stable branch was a nice solution to that where just everything in the stable branch is that release. I don't have a solution for right now. <laughs> it's just something to keep in mind. Yeah, I think that kind of comes down to um, if we populate it, we don't have that problem. Uh, there were some issues the release management team was considering to include uh, issues in epics, I think, in a release. Uh, I believe there was also one for merge requests. Um, I Because currently, I think you can already mark an issue as being in a release, I think. Uh, at least there's some sort of release filter for uh, issues and merge requests. I think that's based on the milestone. I think that already assumes that you know one issue or one merge request only goes in one release. Right, because if we use the milestone, then that's you know it's one to one. It can't be in multiple milestones. Right, and I think that's um, that's kind of a problem. I sort of I guess realized that uh, you can take a sort of minimum viable approach to this. A small step you build something very simple but this is one of those things where if you sort of keep focused on like the minimum steps at some point it's kind of like you walk in the dark and look down and at some point you hit a wall basically um and that's where you're like oh shoot now we're stuck <laughs> how, how do we get around this um that's that's kind of why i like the idea of we sort of populate the, the primary data ourselves through release tools and everything else is just, you know, nice to have. Because then it's okay if, you know, a merge request is only included in like the latest release or you know, an older one because you still have that uh, manually generated markdown data that we populate. Um, let's see, the doc, if there's anything more. Um, Scarbeck, uh, do you want to Mention your item about a keep it change block. Uh, this, yeah, this is probably um, outside of the scope of this OKR, but you know, I had the same question Jarv had about you know what do other companies do, and I was also curious is if there's a standardization behind change logs at all, and I found a project. I don't know anything about this project or who owns it, whether it's an organization or just a personal project on GitHub, but I did find someone who's trying to, you know, at least advertise a set of what could be a standard for change logs. And I'm wondering if there might be some benefit uh, if we could figure out how to solve this problem, if we could give back to the community in a larger format of coming with some sort of standard process that any company can consume. And you know, even if this is a, a product feature specific to GitLab, maybe if we could, you know, maybe pull together a library that we could also release to the public that might be kind of neat. But I don't know. I think it's just a side thought I had while I was uh, doing a little bit of research in preparation for uh, this OKR. Yeah, so as far as I understand, there's a couple of different uh, quote unquote standards. Uh, that's sort of the free form markdown approach that we use. Um, there's the GNU changelog format, which is a little bit of an op format, quite verbose, uh, but it's used by a lot of GNU projects. 
um, there's uh, this one, keep a change log. There's uh, conventional commit, which is one where all the commit titles are prefixed with like attack. Uh, so it's like feet, uh, caller, and then the title, stuff like that. I think they all sort of share a similar amount of, of users, um, with some being more popular than others. I think a lot of Node.js projects, for example, use conventional commits. Um, but then, for example, a lot of Ruby projects have just like a flat list of commits. That's it. Um, like I check some of these bigger projects, they, they use freeform formats, basically. So there's no real standard. So it, it, it differs quite greatly. Um, and in the, the, the original proposal of this epic, I proposed that GitLab could, for example, spit out a changelog file in different formats. You still have these issues, you know, how do you commit that back to the repo and such? Um, the, the tricky thing there is because there's so many formats, uh, it would be this sort of never ending story of people asking, Hey, can you also you know, support this and support that? Um, that's also where I kind of lean towards let's not have GitLab generate change logs, but let's give people the ability to sort of push that data summary if they, they want to. Um, yeah, so there's a couple of different approaches. Uh, but no, no official standard, as far as I know, that people actually follow at like a wide scale. Uh, let's see if there's more. I think that's most of what's on the dock. Uh, I think we're also running towards the end. Um, yeah, is there anything um, anybody would like to discuss further? Or it's, it's basically open mic, so have a go at it. Um, Because if not, then I think we can wrap it up because we've been here, yeah, 45 minutes about. So. Um, I just have one quick comment. In uh, issue 1337, you have the question of what user account would it use? Um, is this the user account that you're referring to building the change log? Or is this the user account that you're referring to to try to provide an author for that change log entry item? Yeah, so the idea is that if you uh, if you want to keep these files and we want to automate that within GitLab, so not through release tools, yeah, we need a way to say, hey, you know, this is the uh, commit details of the the user that made those changes. Now you could enter some you know nonsense username and, and email address because Git doesn't really care about that. Um, but GitLab you know, still has to be able to commit to it. And I'm not sure if through the internals that make up our APIs, if we can somehow have a process commit code without that going through like user authentication and everything, probably there's a way of doing it. We, we, start, we implemented bots recently. They kind of work. I was trying because I have some personal project when I generate stuff on CI and have to commit them back. So it gets better, but I had some random failure of unauthorized so I don't want to deal with this. So I create a, a fake user, but in theory, now you can create, a, it's, it's per project or per group token that gives you a fake user, which is scoped within the, the project and can commit, can do whatever it's needed. All right, that's interesting. And it has a nice yeah, name, so you can say this is the change log bot, and everything we right. have change log bot in the name. Yeah, because I also have some projects where I um, uh, periodically have a bot commit stuff back into GitLab, but it uses an API token associated with my personal account, but then it overrides the username and email on the using the Git config, which works, but it's not ideal because I don't like that it's my personal API token that gives people access to basically my whole account if they ever get that token. Uh, I'll take a look at that CI bot user stuff because that might be interesting because um, we could use it for that then. Although I think you still have issues like if you built this in GitLab, how would it know? So if the format for this file to parse it, it I think that's just a little too much to 
to build in GitLab itself. It might also um, be interesting to figure out if that bot user signs its commits as well. Because I could imagine that being a very important concept for organizations that require that type of um, um, security feature. Right. Yeah, I, I'm willing to bet the answer is no. <laughs> it probably doesn't sign it. Um, yeah, now I'll take a look at that. That uh, might be an option. Uh, okay, so what I'll do, um, I will copy the doc into the Epic just as a comment, or no, I'll make the doc public. It's a little easier uh, so people can see it. Um, probably upload the recording later today, maybe tomorrow, depending on how fast uh, Zoom processes it. Um, and then I'll probably need to discuss this a bit more with Amy, see if, um, well, and based on the feedback from the, the questions, uh, question issues, see if we um, have a solid idea on how to uh, move forward with this. Uh, yeah, with that said, thanks for all the feedback and your time. Um, yeah, unless anybody has anything more to add, I think that will be it. All right, in that case, uh, have a nice uh, day, everybody.